Hello, everybody. Today we have the honor and pleasure of getting to interview Mr. Eric Schaefer. And, oh, hello, there's. And we are so excited for it. Eric, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. This is this is cool. Of course, we're happy to have you. Uh, let's let's just dive in. Let's just start from the beginning. Let's go all the way back to your youth. You played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, do you think this was a starting point for you into getting into game design? Yeah, for sure. Uh, what? Uh, not very deliberately, but yeah, like between I don't know, ages of twelve and sixteen, I was a huge Dungeons and Dragons nerd. My problem was that my friends were not. So <laughs> I was trying to beg them to play, they weren't all that interested. Yep. Uh, my brother, especially at the time, didn't like it. But that's he was my little brother, so I was probably picking on him <laughs> during these, sure. these games. But. Uh, <laughs> What ended up happening is I would design levels and design campaigns and things that no one would ever play because you know, my friends just weren't that interested. Right. But so I, I definitely was into it myself and I fantasized about playing more than I actually played. But it for sure influenced my uh, my later career. I didn't. I don't. I never planned on having a video game career or a computer game career or anything. Yeah. Uh, but I definitely drew back on those those early Dungeons and Dragons times. I mean, how popular was it back then to really go into video game design? I suppose yeah, probably I mean, not near as much as today, <laughs> right? Like, so what yeah, was... It, it wasn't really a thing, so uh, yeah. it was, it's not weird that I wasn't thinking about it. Right. What was your uh, childhood dream then, your, your uh, dream job? I don't think I really had one. I think I, uh, <laughs> I was kind of a math nerd and kind of a computer nerd, even though okay. I did kind of like play. My dad got us an Apple II really early on. Yeah. And so we played a lot of games on there. Nice. Uh, like what, some of the early role playing games were some of my uh, big inspirations too, like Wizardry, Might and Magic, uh, Bard's Tale, these kind of games. Uh huh. Uh, right. So I, I played a lot of those and I even did take my hand, uh, take, you know, a little mod, uh, making little mods. Uh, figuring out how computers even work. Yeah. So I, I did do some of this stuff. It just never occurred to me. So I didn't know what I was going to do in life. I didn't really have a plan. Uh, <laughs> but I worked. I was pretty good at math and pretty good at computers. So I went into a computer science program at Carnegie Mellon. Nice. Called uh, called uh, and, and back then they didn't even have a computer science degree. It was applied mathematics. They were just, yeah, they just threw it into math and were like, it's somewhere over here, right? Yep. <laughs> so uh, that's what I did. I, I was a complete failure, though. I was not <laughs> nearly as smart as a lot of these guys. I'm not sure how I got into that school, just fake to the <laughs> be most. Uh, but I ended up kind of failing out, basically. Mm -hmm. And then, I don't know, did, did weird stuff for five, six, seven, eight years before I just kind of fell into doing computer art, uh, which led into the video game stuff. Interesting. So you kind of started in the art sector and then shifted over from that. What was your first game that you were doing art with? Yeah, so I was making clip art. That's the, barely a thing anymore, wow. but it was an early kind of art field uh, for a temp agency, or I don't know, it was barely a job. But this guy suddenly comes in one day and goes, I got a contract to do a video game for the Atari Lynx system. Okay. And he sa and said, so that's what you're working on now instead of clip art. <laughs> and I said, okay, sounds good. <laughs> and so uh, we just started making this game. It was called, you can probably look it up if anyone's interested, called Gordo 106, the mutated lab monkey. or something. It's like a platform jumper. Uh, but when I had... Um, when I was uh, working on this, I, I hadn't been playing like any games in the last 10 years. I got out of computer gaming uh -huh. uh, during this period of time. And so I kind of had to learn what even a computer, uh, what, you know, what a platformer was uh, and all these things. So 
uh, it was it was completely new to me, but it was fun making the pixel art for this yeah. game. Yeah. And uh, the really the important thing in this period is they hired the same company hired David Brevix to do the the programming for this. Okay. Yeah, you got it. Up. I see it on screen. There yep. it is. Yep. Gordo one hundred and six, the mutated lab monkey. What a title! <laughs> what a title! Wild. It was like they and they had no game design at all. So they're like, "What would a mutated lab monkey do?" And so I just had to invent levels. Okay, we got bad <laughs> scientists. We got bad fashion industry. <laughs> Everyone's trying to torture our poor little lab monkey, and he's trying to escape. I love it. So I was going to ask, how did you meet David? But it sounds like right through there, he was doing weird uh, coding on <laughs> Gordo 106. Yeah, he was right out of college. And he, unlike me, he knew he wanted to get into video games. Uh, so he was yeah. raring to go. And he kind of drove a lot of this, a lot of it. Uh, this company did not last long, though. It was called FM Waves. Mm -hmm. And they kind of shut down I, Dave probably was there for six or eight months while we did this oh, game wow. the whole company crashed and burned and my brother was working there too at the time and instead of paying us because they ran out of money they just gave us all the computer equipment all the that we used to make the game <laughs> and sort of payment and so we took that uh, and started a new little company my brother and I David washed his hands of the whole matter and moved out to Texas and took a real job. Uh -huh. but my brother and I were just like, hey, yeah, let's uh, let's keep trying to make games. Uh, so we started doing it on our own for a little while. It wasn't going so well. We called up David and said, hey, David, move back to California and help us <laughs> make games. And, uh, and he did. Uh, something Aww. I don't remember what was up, but he came back and then we started what was became Condor, yeah, and which that shortly became Blizzard North. So that's that's the beginnings. That's fantastic beginnings. Was uh so was Max also then at FM Waves? Yes. Okay. Both of us were making clip art at this place. Gotcha. Interesting. I I, I don't think I ever heard the the monkey. Gordo 106 uh, from from him when I chatted with him. That's pretty funny. So when you guys were, you went on, created your next company prior to Condor right here. Was it just the learning all the programming a little a little too much there? I'm, was that something that like you didn't have experience with and you gained that kind of from David when he came in with Condor or how did that go? Even though I was like a computer nerd, I was not, I never was good at coding or really did anything. So when Max and I set off on our own, we uh, hired a, uh, another guy gotcha. who was a pretty cool guy, but kind of went crazy on us a little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, this, this is a long time ago now. I can't yeah. really remember how it went down, but yeah. uh, for some reason we ended up yeah just saying, hey, we need Dave's help. He's yep. the only guy who knows what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's great. After only like six to eight months, you were able to form a relationship enough to have him move all the way back, quit his job, and come work with you guys. Yeah, I guess it was, uh, FM Waves was a pretty cool time. I had, I met my ex-wife. She was working there at the time, too, so it was, it was pretty important. That's a, pre that's a, that's a pretty, uh, <laughs> that's a pretty important, like, wildly impactful temp agency short-lived time of your life. Yes, indeed. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, so we move on. Condor is created. How do we come up with Diablo? How do we get to that? I think the, the cool thing right before that is that the, the first day that David moved back here and we, Max and I drive down to his apartment in, in San Jose mm -hmm. and uh, we're sitting there thinking, hey, what kind of game should we do? What can we, uh, what, what should we, how do we make this company? Yeah. So, but while we're sitting there, he gets a call from a guy who worked with his previous company and that, that guy was saying, Hey David, I hear you're going to start a new company. Uh, we want you to make a game for us. You have three options. You can make, uh, and here's the three games we can make: a Scooby Doo <laughs> game, 
<laughs> the Aerosmith game, Ooh. and uh, and Justice League Task Force, uh, which is a fighting game with uh, Batman, Superman, and all. Uh-huh. Uh, we uh, and we we picked right there on the phone that day Justice League. Okay, we'll do Justice League. And so we had a, a contract on day one to wow. pick this game and an IP. And so uh, we I spent the next year pretty much making a fighting game based on the old Street Fighter fighting games. Yeah. Just for Justice League Task Force. That went pretty well. Uh, but the and the, the interesting part, the critical part of this story is we went to our first E3 show, or it was actually the CES show that did video games back then. Okay. But, it, and it was, hey, we were going to show our game at this CES show for the first time. Uh, and we we set up a little booth, and we're standing there, and we noticed that there's a booth nearby of some guys making exactly the same game. <laughs> Justice League Task Force fighting game. And they were making it for the Nintendo, and we were making it for the Sega Genesis. Uh huh. And that company was Blizzard. That was Synapse and Sorcery, the first <laughs> name of Blizzard. Yeah. And we were going, what? What the hell? Well, you guys are making the same game. It's so weird that they hired two companies for different not consoles. knowing each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to make two different consoles. But that's how we met those guys. We became good friends uh, at that point. Uh, just because you know it was crazy circumstance, we're right. all doing the same thing. We're similar kind of guys, right? So that game wrapped up, and we're saying, "Hey, what do we want to do next?" And uh, what we wanted to do next was Diablo. Uh, David, David was hugely into rogue like the early rogue games, like Rogue and Ang Band, and uh, a bunch of these text based, yeah, uh, dungeon explorer type of games. And at the same time, we, we we were just playing XCOM, the first XCOM. Nice. So we, we basically combined those two games, the, uh, Rogue and XCOM. Uh, so Rogue-type gameplay, XCOM graphics. <laughs> and uh, said, hey, let's, let's, do, let's make it called Diablo. Another yeah. cool thing is Gravik had had the name Diablo before we even knew what kind of game it was. He lived near Mount Diablo in yep. the Bay Area as a yep. kid. And always wanted to name a game Diablo. Uh, and it was just a perfect little match for this. So right. we we made this Diablo game and um, or we made this pitch, right? We we made I think it's online somewhere the Yeah, initial. I did a I did a review. I, I, I like read through the whole pitch of it. Yeah, it's really cool because now I, I hadn't seen it in so long and I realized it was very similar to the game we actually made. Yeah. More, more so than most pitches turn into games. Yeah. Uh, it was really cool to see. But so we made that, and then we shopped it around. We went to some game show, I think the next CES, and tried to convince a whole lot of companies that this is the game that would be cool. Yeah. And they all they all shot us down. They they didn't like it at all, really. Uh, the, we had like five game pitches, and we thought this was going to be the best one. But uh, nobody bought into it. Yeah. Uh, so we were talking to the the Blizzard guys. I I don't know if they were called Blizzard quite at this point, but they said, "Hey, yeah, we just got bought by this company called Davidson, and they're looking for more games. So let's do this game that you want to do. It kind of nice. a nice little match with the game. They they were just starting uh, Warcraft, the first Warcraft. Uh huh. You know, they're kind of thematically similar. Yeah. So. We uh we they they basically hooked us up with Davidson to publish this game, Diablo, and that's how we got started with Diablo. Wow. So. Wow, that's that's super interesting. The first the first thought I have is, man, this is just a whole who you know sort of <laughs> world <laughs> that everything is rolling through. Uh, and just coincidence after coincidence, which is, you know, fantastic. You, you think of all the places that if, you know, you guys weren't next to each other at the booths, if, the, you know, all the places, things could have gone differently. Um, so, yeah, it was, uh, got lucky, I guess. Yeah, so it, it's really interesting uh, to, to hear how it all has come together there. Um, but additionally, just hearing, like, even like okay so they were making warcraft and then that got pulled in because i figured 
Warcraft, Starcraft, Diablo. I don't know. They've all got such a great feel that runs similarly in a way to me. That I mean, they're different games, but you know, but I don't. I I think it was it was just different enough, but thematically the same. We're kind of probably the same market at the time. Yeah. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, okay, so we meet We meet up. What was, uh, as someone who is making a game, as you know, uh, what was something that you found when trying to pitch the game, sell the game, all of this was the biggest difficulty? I can't, I can't really remember why people didn't like it. Uh, mostly because I think we were just... I, I, at this point, we probably had an eight-man team when we made this Justice League game. Uh-huh. Uh, it wasn't a big hit, and we were kind of just jokers. We were young, <laughs> goofy-looking guys. Uh, so I, I don't know if they took us seriously. Gotcha. It's, it's probably mostly it. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I mean, I, I read, like I said, I read through that Diablo uh, book, and I thought or the the selling points of it there. I thought it was fantastic. And I also noticed you guys were kind of creators of microtransactions with the idea of having just like floppies with random items on them at the store. And people right. could go and buy and not know what they were getting and then they would plug it in. So it's like a loot box. Yeah, it was. It was. It was all inspired. We were all Magic the Gathering freaks at that point. Uh, I mean, we so all we were. Were, you know, During company hours, we'd run down to the local store and buy some packs. Uh, <laughs> and we were just thinking, how do we fold that excitement into the game? Yeah. So yeah, we kind of created the loot box. Yeah. <laughs> that time. I was. I blamed all EA and all these other companies, but it was you. It was you who created the loot box. <laughs> Though I do think it would be much more exciting to go and physically get one and all of that, you know. And it, yep. It does sound fun to me, but. <laughs> I mean, that part never happened, but yeah. Yes. We'll, we'll take somebody to blame. Yes, it, it never did happen. But it was in the pitch. It was in the yes. pitch. Um, okay, so we go, we're with Blizzard. We were developing Diablo 1. At what time did you know we've made something special this is going to be big uh i think there was a couple of key moments one of them was uh when we first got our first monster in game was the uh, skeleton right? yeah we just said hey let's make a little skeleton with a sword uh and and we had just enough of the background to like okay we go down the stairs and there's a skeleton there's a few skeletons in a in the room down there and the first time that we swing at this thing and it hits the skeleton and it smashes on the ground and we had <laughs> Matt Ullman was on the team and he had made this sound effect of just dropping some pencils onto a wooden desk. I can hear it. Yep. And it, yeah, and it was it was tactile and we I, I think we just kind of were stood there in amazement. Oh my God, this is going to be great. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, it was like you know it was it was turning these dungeon explorer type of games into a visual tactile experience that was that was our whole intention and the first interaction was okay we got a winner this is perfect let's yep. just uh keep going from here so that i think that was the big the really cool big moment uh then we had some you know famously people know that it was turn based even at that stage and it became later on it became uh real time obviously yep uh just to clarify on that too because this story gets told a lot of times the infamous story (laughs) right i I, what i like to point out though is it was turn-based but it was maybe not like you expect it was more like these rogue games where you would move and the monster would kind of automatically move so you could kind of pace it as much as you were moving the monster would move it wasn't radically turn-based like you're playing xcom or Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 actual game uh so that was a big moment too when we turned it into real time it took us like a day to do uh and it was like wow okay this is definitely a winner and then the third big moment was we first put it we first showed it at uh the game 
E3 or whatever the game show we were showing it as. It was at the Blizzard booth. They were farther along with Warcraft, maybe even released. And we just had like one or two mach machines showing off our little Diablo game. But it got great attention. People loved it. Yeah. We ended up setting up more machines right there at the show, just and it just kept growing crowds. So uh, we, we kind of knew all along it was, hey, we're on the right track. This is cool. The reaction was so good. Blizzard said, "Okay, let, let's take more time and let's uh, let's expand the game yeah. uh, from the scope that it was." And so, all that was rolling really cool. But in the in the background, our company was was cra was falling apart. We were out of money. <laughs> we, uh, we were we didn't know how to really do business and didn't know how much trouble we were getting into. But we were not even paying our payroll taxes. Oh my God. Which I don't know if anyone here <laughs> runs a business, but you can get into big trouble not doing your payroll taxes <laughs> to the degree that the IRS came and, and hammered a notice into our door saying, you were, we were putting, you were going to seize all your money and put you out of business and seize everything. Uh, then we finally started to take that seriously. Yeah. Uh, had to borrow some money from a friend but luckily, right at that point, so Diablo's going great, but the company's about to go out of business. <laughs> uh, luckily, at that point, Davidson came in because they saw that, hey, Diablo was catching on. Yeah. Uh, and they said, hey, we want to buy you guys out. And we were like, okay, as soon as you possibly can, buy us out, please. <laughs> and, uh, they saved our ass, but at the same time, we probably sold well, you know, this gold mine way before yeah. we realized the value. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it allowed you guys to get the funding and everything to actually then continue and produce it and all of that. So yep. that's, you know, trade-offs there, I suppose. Um, okay, so the actual game of Diablo 1, give us a good look into your role uh, with the creation of it and kind of some of your like favorite parts okay so i was doing i think i was i was i, I wouldn't have described myself as the designer really at the beginning i think that david and i uh m mostly david and i hashed out a lot of these things together uh -huh. but he was sort of the driving creative force uh of the of the game at the, in the early stages and getting all these things working right. i was i did all the uh environmental art okay like in the entire game so i did all the backgrounds i did all the ui art until the end we got some paint overs by uh by uh artist ben booze did mm -hmm. a really cool job for us after that too yeah so and i was the art director of the character team which was pretty small it was like three or four guys so i was art director and artist kind of did all these things and collaborated with dave on on the design but the design was pretty simple and he was he was leading it early uh leading all the cool features early just by making it happen himself uh, yeah was the main engineer yeah uh towards the end i took over maybe more of a design role as we started to balance the stuff and started to flesh it out and sort of team lead role it was kind of i think david <laughs> was the was the 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 for the design force and the and the guy who made the big things happen made some of the big calls uh, and I was sort of the support uh, right-hand man, and I was a little more of a team lead. I would go around and see, make sure everybody was on schedule uh -huh. uh, and doing that kind of stuff. So I think it was mostly him and I. I, I don't want to leave my brother out. He was leading <laughs> a, a football game at the time, uh, which was providing pretty much our only money. The, uh, Blizzard liked our Diablo design, but they didn't give us very much money to do it. <laughs> where we are. So we we kind of funded Diablo with this football game he was making. Um, then so yeah, that was my my Diablo one role. Nice, good job, Max. Thanks for funding the project. Uh, very cool. And I mean, I have to say, I love the art and backgrounds and color palettes and everything of Diablo one. Um, and this is something I think you talked about as well, bringing into Diablo two 
a similar idea but then improving the palette so you could have more colors while also not having too many colors because you were working with very limited colors back then yeah i think uh we were we were pushing the limits of what game engines could do uh with diablo 2 it doesn't seem like it now but uh i think that that it really the palette stuff that yeah we talked talked about in your chat the other day yeah uh uh, hey, I just want to break in and say I, I lurk on your channel quite often, <laughs> and uh, often when I'm on there, I uh, I type something into the into the chat, right? I say, yeah. oh, actually, I, here's how it actually happened, or I give a little Diablo two fact yet, and nobody, if anyone <laughs> in the chat ever responds, they're just laughing at me. <laughs> or, but usually, I just get ignored and go. This time, finally, you saw it and got me into the discussion. That was kind of fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's one of those, you know, the chat's moving, people say stuff, lots of people talk and make up their own facts or say how that how it actually is. And you have to kind of, you know, live fact checking and things can be tough. So I apologize for all the times I've ignored your uh, additional <laughs> comments you've added to the conversation. <laughs> No worries. It's not. It's not just your channel. Nobody ever believes me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, my, my my mod says you're just like a moderator, Eric. Nobody he, Lama doesn't listen to us either. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So yes. Actually, that's... I have a funny story about uh, about this. I was in a World of Warcraft guild once, just anonymously. I, I never tell people really who I am. Uh -huh. But so I'm playing. We're playing. We're getting ready for a raid or something. Uh, just chatting in the thing and somebody brings up Diablo 2 at the time uh, and I was uh, and I was a little drunk and I just said hey yeah I was designer of Diablo 2 or something like that <laughs> and they're like what that doesn't make any sense and, they, and then they started to quiz me everybody started <laughs> to quiz me you know and I couldn't answer any of their questions. <laughs> it was like, what, 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 where does this thing drop? Or where yeah. do you, get, you know, all these technical questions. And I, I couldn't answer any of them. And so they're all just like, ah, he's full of shit. <laughs> Bring it all and just uh, and never did. I never brought it up again. <laughs> so that's also warning you. If you ask me questions about Diablo 2, I probably won't get them right. Right. I mean, oh, yeah. again, it's, you know, 23 years ago that it released, designing even further. You've worked on many things since then. And, yeah, it makes sense that even, you know, there's there's systems I've designed already in Long RPG where I have to go back and, like, look up. I'm like, wait, how did, it, how did I decide to do that again? How does that yeah. work? And yeah, it's like, another factor is that we... Uh, we uh... We work with dev names, so most items and skills have different names. Yeah. Like, I think of the monsters as the the rhino monster, the, dis, the, <laughs> the, the spitting monster, the mosquito demon. Yeah. And I, I never remember the actual names we end up with at the end, even if they were often my name. But I don't remember which is which. I don't remember what made it into the final cut of the game, because I play the hell out of it yeah. right until release. And then I don't remember... Hey, did this make it into the game or not? So, all these factors make it hard to, to, to even talk about what I've done. That's. I will. I will try and not get too specific on on pieces, but there may be a couple times. Sure. Um. All right. Next on. So Diablo One is created, and instantly. I, I I believe Max was saying you guys were ready to go into Diablo 2. What were the lessons and thoughts from Diablo 1 that you wanted to swing over into that? Yeah, I've, within about three months of the release, uh, I started to just jot down a list of all the things we could do. It started with the things that uh, the things that we didn't quite get it in, into Diablo One, mm -hmm. but it was sort of like a wish list that didn't make the cut. And then when it became it was clear, I just kept expanding that list to <laughs> just basically a huge wish list of things we it would be fun to do. Yeah, it it ended up being about three pages long uh, of just you know bullet points. More, right. more monsters, more levels, more characters. Uh, a little more specific than that, but 
just a big wish list. And that was the only design doc we ever had. We just, <laughs> we never made a design doc for the game and I almost <laughs> never had in my career. Uh, but th this was almost the, the least we ever started with. So we just started the game making new stuff for Diablo 1, uh, in a sense. Yeah. But then kind of just, you know, building on that and iterating and, and shaping it into what became Diablo 2. So hey, what... Oh, what was that? It sorry? occurred to me... Uh, let me let me back up a second, because sure. it occurred to me that, you, that my old Diablo... My old Dungeons & Dragons geekiness back in the, when I was, you know, yeah. 12 years old... Uh, one of my favorite things in the and the, in the how it got applied then to Diablo One is I loved the little random item generator in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh -huh. it, was, it was very simple, like, hey, you could just roll the dice and get a plus three sword. And I don't, I was just fascinated by that table. So I think that was kind of my main contribution then to the Diablos. The, what became the affix system, you know, which now is standard throughout just about every yes. game, yes. especially all yes. the games I worked on. But that's how, that's the, one of the big influences from my old days, just reading the books and faking campaigns, uh, is just extrapolating on that and making all, all these cool magic items. That was my favorite thing, I, I believe, at the time. Nice. And, and I mean, that know, is one of the, if not, you know, for me, the biggest piece uh, of Diablo that I love, that I'm taking over in Talama RPG in its own way, of course, um, yep. is the affix system, the generation of the items. I think Diablo hits it on the head, you know, Diablo 2 especially for me. Just You just get the feeling, that rush, because the items mean so much. They, they're so cool. It's so rewarding to find that drop, you know, get that role. And there's so many different roles that can be interesting. And uh, I love it. I think it's, I, I I think that was a fantastic addition then, if not the most important from, you know, for me. Yeah, well, thanks. I, and that, I, I really love it uh, to this day. I, I'm still doing that to this day. <laughs> still writing down ideas for that. And, <laughs> that's, that's my favorite part of game development, I think yeah loot <laughs> yes it's it's just so great um what pieces do you wish what do you what's your biggest wish that you would have gotten into d2 from that list that just didn't get in there huh that's a good question um I think that we got most stuff in. I think the thing that stands out, I don't know how much it hurts the game that, to not have it, is we didn't, we intended Act 4 to be a full-size act, right? right. The, the hell to be uh, full-size with, with more, more different looks and more quests. Uh, and that's what really <laughs> got truncated at the very end. Right. But, uh, right. but for better or worse, we pretty much got everything we wanted to do in the game which led to the lateness of the uh, the game and the yeah. incredible crutch time it took to get it done but uh, I feel like I, I don't feel like any, we missed any kind of dynamics or any systems or anything that we wanted to do pretty much oh I got one now that I'm thinking about it is um, late in the in the game we said hey you know what we shouldn't have a chat room with all your little characters at the bottom and you just chat, we should make that part of the game. Uh, and we should, what we were calling Battle.net Town. So instead of Battle.net chat room that you'd make games out of, uh -huh. you'd be in a little town with the same 30 guys or whatever that were in your in your chat rooms. Oh, that'd be uh, fun. So, yeah, so it, that was like early... I think it was a little influenced by MMOs, but it was yeah. kind of like, you know how ARPGs have you know, pushed it their way into MMOs a little bit these right. days. There's crap over there. And I think that was kind of the biggest idea we had uh, that would, it would have been a more modern, cooler game, but it was just, we thought of it too late. Yeah. That, I mean, I think that would have been super fun. Yeah, it's like a literal in-game chat room in, yeah. in a way there. That'd and be... In fact, that, yeah, the ArenaNet guys, uh, 
were, you know, with Guild Wars, when they were ex-Blizzard guys that worked really closely. Uh, those two guys, Michael Bryan, Pat Wyatt, worked really closely on uh, with us on this idea of even Battle.net Town. And so they implemented that into Guild Wars. That's kind of how Guild Wars even started. It was like, instead, you know, it's a different camera and all, but they, uh, it was ARPG, but mm. you, it, it had Battle.net Town, which we called it, <laughs> but, uh, as their starting point. So they got to it before we did. <laughs> and I know that guild halls were something that you guys at some point had been planning but never came to fruition. Can you speak more yeah. on that? Yeah, that I you know what I never thought it it turned into much. Uh it was our idea how to make it a more social game, how to make guilds interesting and why people would want to do it. Uh and we we get there was a guild and there was a guild hall level in and we had a few little dynamics yeah. in there to make it work nothing th there was nothing like that in the final shipping game right <laughs> right yes <laughs> nothing at all uh it it uh i don't know it, it didn't ever feel like it it came through it, it didn't it didn't coalesce right so we kind of I guess you could say if we had more time we probably would have kept going on it but I didn't feel personally that we were losing anything by dropping it. It just wasn't really going anywhere yeah. without more thought. Yeah. I think it I definitely think it would have been a hit for it because that's something I mean even you know I think from there two games to today and all of this stuff and what I loved about what was so great about Diablo online was the social aspect and i think there actually still was really great social dynamic in it um and just the ways that you were you know meeting people whether it was in lobbies whether it was in games all of that um but i think having guilds to then further do that would have been successful and and fantastic because it would have just further enhanced the great social piece of the game uh which you know, I think is is a, a big sell. You know, why when I'm when I'm playing online, that's what I really crave, right? Is that like social piece? Because it's like if I want to be solo, I'll just go play offline. You know. So. Yep, I think it would have been a good uh, a good way to continue development. Yeah, I think uh, I, I you know I often think that if we had today's business models, we would have just, you know, made Diablo 2 a live service game. <laughs> yeah. And that would have obvious directions to go with, uh, you know, the continued development. But instead, back in the day, just the ROI calculations of doing a business, it was just like, what we got to do is another new game instead of just continuing on development. So right. in some ways, it would have been a lot cooler if we had just been able to keep going. Yeah. That's true. Uh, so speaking of making another game there, uh, 2000 Diablo drops, 2001 Lord of Destruction. Uh, what would you, what were the thoughts heading into the expansion? And then to follow on that, were there additional expansions that you guys were planning or anything beyond that? Or was that a piece to be set just done? Yeah, the the uh, the expansion. So right after Diablo two, I kind of mentally crashed a little bit, as did all the team. <laughs> yeah, this was an eighteen month crunch essentially. Right. Uh, so we got some of the fresher people on the team to do the expansion, uh, and so I didn't have a ton of. I consulted on design, but I didn't really work on it. Uh, what I remember is that it really went very smoothly. These guys, Max and Tyler and Peter Who and the guys on, on the expansion, uh, and Phil took over all the character. Phil Shank took over all the character design stuff. Yeah. The uh, uh, what uh, what I remember mostly is, hey, this thing went smoothly. This was the first Blizzard game that ever shipped on time. The Diablo Two expansion, uh -huh. Destruction. Uh, and so for me, it was, look at that, it's, this is awesome. It just happened on its own, it didn't kill me. <laughs> and we got the game out in time. But uh, the intention even during that was that team was gonna go on and make Diablo 3. Right. Uh, at the same time, 
our team had become pretty big, maybe 45-ish people by the end of Diablo 2. And half of us were burned out, having made Diablo for the last five, six years, and wanted to kind of move on and do something new. So we split into two teams. It was essentially the Diablo expansion, Diablo 3 team, mm -hmm. and an experimental team, which was led by myself and David Grevick. Uh, and it kind of meandered and went nowhere interesting for a, uh, for a year and a half, two years before the, we ended up leaving Blizzard. Mm -hmm. uh, we we had settled on it took a while but we were finally at the end making a game that we called co codename Starblow because it was a, it was a <laughs> right space yes Diablo. yes <laughs> and uh, we thought that, that we didn't intend that to be the release name we thought it was really clever but the uh, you know, as a as a dev <laughs> as a placeholder name but the Blizzard South guys hated it they thought it was, it was so bad they were offended almost. <laughs> it was a really odd meeting when we said, hey, you know what? We're going to make this game called Starblow. Uh, <laughs> that, I think that actually, though, was pretty promising. It was going pretty well when we left. Uh, so I don't know. It, who knows what it would have developed. But we were going in some neat directions mm -hmm. with, with that Starblow game. I mean, I, I would love to sit down and just hear more Starblow, honestly. Uh what what do you think was your favorite part of Starblow, the the most interesting piece? Uh, I think that for me, and I, and I what I had to convince the rest of the team that you could even do a science fiction game in the in the Diablo camera, Diablo game style, uh -huh. uh, because they were saying, you know, you in science fiction, you you got guns mostly and cannons and all these things. How does right. that work with action on the screen? Right, right now, a lot of people have done similar games, and it makes a lot of sense. But at the time, nobody really put it together, you know. So I had to kind of convince the team. And one thing that kind of convinced them is we had a really cool laser gun effect. You would like this old 50s sci-fi ray gun. Yeah. And it would shoot out this laser thing and kind of attach to a monster. It's basically, a, you know, a lightning-y looking skill. But it just felt sci-fi. It was like, okay, cool. This is going to work. Yeah. And then especially in the environment we had, had all these funky sci-fi plants and environment. It, was, it had a neat retro feel to it. The, uh, the other cool thing about it was you would pilot a ship. We, you had your own ship, and it would go planet to planet. So you'd go explore new planets that we'd generate underneath you. The ship sort of operated as a town. So you'd have on the ship the quest givers and the, and yeah. the, the trade skill guys. This is also a concept I've seen people put into their own games many times now since then. But just coming up with that stuff was, was my favorite part of that development. So you kind of created Starfield a little bit in a way. Yeah, I'm going to take responsibility. I, I, I <laughs> sent those guys an email, but they won't get back to me. I should get some royalties. Yeah, right. We need to, we need to figure that out. Uh, okay, so you guys were making Starblow, which I really wish I could play. Um, and then the other half was making Diablo 3. What was that looking like? Because obviously very different from Diablo 3 that actually presented and came out. Yeah. So Diablo 3 was, uh, it was, the big change, the first immediate change was we went to a new engine, a 3D, a real 3D engine. Diablo 2 was this, I don't know, you know, 2D engine with a little bit of 3D faked in, as I'm sure you and the audience here is familiar. Yeah. But uh, Diablo 3 was going to, it was a real 3D engine. Uh, it, ha it And we, they, those guys, the team was really making good use of it. They, the levels had a lot of depth. Uh, I remember right at the beginning, they were throwing around these little fire missiles through the darkness, like down into pits and, and across dark rooms. You know, light it up, and it was just like, oh my god, that's so cool. Yeah. Uh, it was the er, that early Diablo three design was way more of an MMO. It, it, in fact, it even had like factions. We were intending there to be oppo opposing factions. Uh, a lot of us were were into a lot of MMOs and a lot of even faction based ones, like Dark Age of Camelot. Mm -hmm. We were playing a lot. They had a neat three way faction system. I don't think we were gonna do three way or anything, but so a lot of the early design beyond the new graphic changes were about how we would have 
factions and how this would be more of a PvP, uh -huh. more of a territory battle kind of a, a thing. Uh, and that's kind of how it was going. They were making so it was neat new graphic stuff, uh, new characters were thrown around, and all this MMO stuff that was all being experimented on and, and worked on. Pretty fun stuff. Dang. So was that was that all of that really just scrapped then? Uh, in terms of what we actually see in Diablo three? Did they just kind of yeah, toss it and restart over? A completely? lot of it. A lot of it. I, I know that some of the graphics that we were making actually ended up if not in the final Diablo three release, mm -hmm. uh the, it uh, was up there in their screenshots and their promo stuff until the very end. And a couple of the artists who, who were on it were saying, yeah, the, I mean, the, some of the team remained. Yeah. Uh, and so their stuff kind of got in. But I think none of the design ideas uh, continued. As, I, as yeah. I recall, I'm no expert on Diablo 3 here, but it really kind of dwindled into almost not doing anything for a couple of years there. <laughs> uh, the team the team shrunk. They, you know, they kind of scavenged some of the team to put on uh, emergencies on other projects. And then so it took a little while of there in a lull until they built it back up and started up again. And when they did, it was, you know, with a, the design that they ended up shipping with. Right. So, yeah. Right. Um, Thoughts on we, we can I, I don't want to dive too much into you know all of all of that piece I feel like we could <laughs> talk plenty there um, so let's let's shift a little bit with D two thoughts on resurrected shifting over a little bit I thought it was fairly incredible I what I love about it is just playing it and toggling the graphics back and forth. Yeah, uh, I, it never gets old to me. I, I always because when I'm playing D D two R, I feel like that's the game that we made. Uh, right. For me, especially, I love the that they kept all my systems pretty much <laughs> intact. Yes. Right. They didn't screw with my stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I I didn't feel bad. I was really concerned, honestly, that when they were gonna when they announced this and they were planning it, that first of all I was saying two things in my mind. One is they're just going to screw it up, you know, yeah. they're just going to, but then worse than that, I, uh, the other thought I had was, what if they make it better than <laughs> our, our original design? Uh, so the way it came out was, okay, I'm happy. They pretty much kept it intact, yep. so I didn't have to feel bad or, or good <laughs> about this thing. Um, and I just love seeing how our graphics got translated. I think they did a really wonderful job. I thought it was interesting watching just your stream the other day where you were saying, hey, there's advantages of the old style. Yeah. Uh, and that's like that the, the, some contrast elements stood out better. And there, in some ways, the, it, the, the, our first style was better. I think that, yeah. uh, I think I kind of thought that in my head, but I think you articulated it real well. Uh, but I don't know. I loved it. I, I wouldn't say I put hundreds of hours into playing. I don't. I think I played D2R through the through killing Diablo once, and that was probably about it. But yeah, I, I thought it was cool. Yeah. No, I think uh, your thoughts echo my thoughts for all of it as well. When it was first announced, and they came to me first, and they showed me the like video, and. I was like the first person to see it and they wanted my like reaction to it and then they were like will you present it at BlizzCon and I and I had like a million thoughts and emotions going through my head and you can see as I'm reacting to the video that I wasn't like overly crazy excited because my first thoughts as well and this is also it came after Reforged where that kind of had some struggle was, oh no, are they gonna ruin Diablo? <laughs> yeah. And so I was like, this looks cool, but I'm like worried that they're gonna like screw with the systems, or they're gonna shove all these microtransactions in it. And I was, you could kind of see confusion on my face. But once I was interviewing them and talking through it with them and all of that stuff, I realized 
They knew what the game was. They loved the game for what it was. And they were going to bring it to, you know, just the modern world. And I agree. I think they did a fantastic job. I don't think they made the game this crazy better game. I don't think they made the, this game the, this crazy worst game. I think it's the game in 2020, you know, whenever it was released, 2019, 2020, whatever it was. Um 2021 maybe somewhere around there it it was it was really tastefully done and like you said there's still some instances where i'm like i kind of prefer the old but then there's others where i'm like i like the new so it's just a a slight variation on it um but yeah i i i i echo your sentiment there completely it's it's very similar um one one thing that is interesting about you talking about that and how they brought it to you and showed you what's funny is they never showed it to me you know they never <laughs> you would think they would even just i don't know yes. I, i'd be happy to go consult or help them out i i even was reading in the interview where they were like what we found we found a bunch of archival uh art and things that never got used and we yeah. managed to track they hired an archivist or something like that yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and i was uh all I would think of, why don't they just give me a call? I can give them so much information. <laughs> You're uh, like, yeah, I knew all that. Doing. No, they completely <laughs> ignore our existence at all. Uh, they're, they're probably worried, right? They're like, oh no, if we if we let them get too close to it, we may have to give them all sorts of stuff. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, or we we start shitting on it or something. Right? Like yeah, exactly. They're like maybe it's just best weird to read about it as if that you know we were long dead or something. Right, right. Best to best to just ignore and pretend. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you you'd said you were worried they would mess with your systems. What? So we had talked in Diablo one. You were more art, um, and then some of the design with Brevik in Diablo two. What systems did you really uh, handle and and build in? Yeah. I, so I. Uh, I know. I, again, I give Gravik credit for like the big ticket items. Like he he brought up the idea of doing a skill tree uh, that was due to you know playing Civ Six or mm-hmm. Civ Four I think, or Civ I don't know Civ Two at the time. Uh, so, but w- he would bring up these great ideas, and I would sort of implement them. I would I would you know so he said skill tree and i'm like yeah let's do it yeah. so i started constructing the skill trees and how they would work and and how the hierarchies would go nice and so i kind of see him as he uh, I, and there's you know there's a bunch of guys on the team I, i'm not trying to claim all the credit on this right right, right. Uh, yes but i feel like i sort of was the implementer of the of his great ideas um uh, and on top of that i did like all the uh again i did all the loot and all the items and all the affixes uh and all the uniques and stuff not all of them towards the end i handed a lot off that to some of the other guys to do some of the uniques but uh i consider that like the loot is my my system i call it uh the combat and combat balance was all on me for the most part nice uh so yeah, any the economy, all those things were sort of what I was in charge of during this. I I, I had some art. I did the UI at the uh, during Diablo two again with paint overs at the end. Uh, so that was that was my most my responsibility as well as team lead. But mm-hmm. I don't know. I think of all the that, that's what I was protective of is the balance, the loot drops. The uh, the economy, the combat systems, all that kind of stuff, I felt protective of when I heard about this D2R. I mean, those are some of my favorite pieces of all the systems. I'm uh, I love the economy in it. I love the uh, items in it. I think the combat is fantastic. Uh, so yeah, hats off to to those. Uh, Thank you. Because that's. Yes, as Phil Shank says right there in the chat, Eric is the one that makes playing Diablo 2 feel like Diablo 2. I feel like those are the things that, you know, I really think of when I think of Diablo 2. Obviously, there's tons of pieces, and I'm not going to discredit the other team members um, because, like you said, everybody uh, creates and combines for all of it. But 
I do think those are like very important pieces that I would consider. So, yeah. and who is M, gotta... who is MB Fu in the chat? Oh, uh, Peter. Peter. Who? Okay, that's Peter. I, I believe. Yes. Oh, and Shank the Overseer, that's probably yeah, Phil, Yeah, that's right? Phil. Yeah, we got we got Phil and Peter in the chat as well here. Uh, Peter says he's the reason that uh, guilds never came to fruition. <laughs> so <laughs> probably it. We can... Yeah, I mean, Peter <laughs> took over a lot of this stuff. Uh, uh, a lot on the D2R, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, Lord of Destruction. But then, he, you know, he was kind of the last guy in the team doing rune words, doing all these kind of things that really made a lot of the systems, what that, a lot of the systems that people love today, too, mm -hmm. are kind of Peter's. So I've worked with Peter. I'm working with him right now. The new company I told you about called Moon Beast. But, uh, but I've worked with him a lot in my career and Phil Shank. So that's why they're both in here. <laughs> they're the only guys I told I was doing this. <laughs> And he also says, "I apologize for rune words." Also, Anthony, man, we're gonna have to, we're gonna just have to set up uh, a whole thing. Anthony's here as well. We're gonna have to set up a whole call uh, later on here and just get everybody in. I would just love to sit back and yeah, let Anthony you guys. Yeah, Anthony on, is on my the new team here, getting the, getting the gang back together, getting half the gang back together to to work on a game right now yeah uh, we also have uh colin day who was one of the chief engineers there towards the end and uh brian fitzgerald who was like blizzards he ran ba battle net for blizzard for a long time yeah uh probably forgetting somebody but yeah we've got a, a lot of the old team back together here so a, a little bit more with d2 and then i do want to hop to that um so we have Diablo 2 and, and, and then LOD comes out. Um, where and, and what was your involvement or, or whatnot in patch in the patching, right? Because when we get to patch, for instance, 1.10, we do get this big shift in the game uh, and all sorts of systems changing um, right there. And yes, we've got enigma and all the you know all, all of this wild stuff uh, over that time so what was your involvement in those pieces and if plenty what was my, the feeling there my involvement was was nothing zero all right uh, it was pretty much peter's baby uh, <laughs> all that stuff i was literally either you know, burned out. Then I took a six month sabbatical. I moved to wow. Manhattan for six months to just clear my head. Uh, so a lot of these things <laughs> happened while I was gone and uh, and I had no involvement whatsoever. There you uh, go. So blame better. Peter if you hate it and thank Peter if you love it, everybody. <laughs> you gotta thank him. He did a lot of cool stuff. <laughs> also, who moves to Manhattan to clear their head? <laughs> I agree. <laughs> of all the places I would go to, like, clear my head, Manhattan. No, I'm, I'm comfortable in anonymity. I just want to disappear into a crowd. I'm a city guy. <laughs> okay. There you go. That's, that's fair. That's fair. So, all right. Moving on from Diablo... Uh, you talked about having some of the gang back together. Uh, you have CCO of Moonbeast Entertainment in your title here. Uh, what can you give us? What can you break down for us? What are you creating today? Right. So, uh, like, about a, I don't know. A, I've been I've been with Moonbeast now about eight months I'd say. Uh, okay. But it's been the, I think that is it was in existence for about a year before that, and it was Peter and Phil, and a couple of and a, a crew of some other guys that created this company. And I was I was talking to them. They were they were they wanted me to join up early, but I was like oh, I think I'm retired. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm taking it easy for a little while. I just. Ship the Rebel Galaxy games yep. uh, with like 2015 or whatever, right? Yeah, uh, or something. Who knows? There. Was it that long ago? I think I, I think that's time. when it was, right? 
Well, there's two. I think the first one. Was oh, 2015. first one's 2015. Yeah. 2017 or 18. Yeah. In any case, I was semi-retired, taking it easy, uh, and they were, and but I would kind of consult. They would show me what they were doing, and then at some point, beginning of this year, they showed me their current build, and I thought, oh my god, it's incredible, almost. I gotta, I gotta, let's let let me just come on as a consultant a little bit and just yeah. kind of tinker with yeah. you guys. And uh, it was pretty quick that just hanging out in their Slack dis uh, chat rooms and uh, just throwing out ideas that it was it was just too comfortable and too fun to start working on. So we decided, yeah, let me join in. I'm all in. I got to I got to do ARPGs. It's just in my blood. So th they what they're working on. They had a, a new engine and some new dynamics to wrap around the ARPG. A lot of the familiar ARPG stuff that we've been working on, but some really cool new features that I thought, you know what, that's so fun and so neat to play with yeah. that it kind of, you know, it pulled me out of retirement or whatever it was. <laughs> and uh, and the team was just so so fun to work with. The team is very interactive and we just, we can, you know, make changes, make big things happen in a short amount of time. Oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm super, super happy with what we're doing. It's it's really making an ARPG, as you know from Llama, <laughs> Llama <laughs> RPG, is uh, very difficult. There's so much, yes. so many parts to these games, uh, and it's it's hard. It's uh, we run into difficulties, but I don't know. It's this is my, the only thing I know how to do in life, basically, is ARPGs. Yeah. So I'm I'm happy and comfortable where what we're doing now. Yeah, I think the the ever expanding scope of everything is the the tough part. You like sit down and you're like, I want to make a game, and you're like, cool, I'll design like items, and then you're like, okay, I have to design all the bases, and then all of the is there durability? Is what are the speeds? How is speed affecting everything? And then it's like, now let me get into affixes, and oh my gosh, I have to create. And this is where I really grow to appreciate your Diablo 2 uh, itemization there, is I'm thinking through all of the pieces of every affix. So it's like, what items can this affix roll on? When can it roll on these items? At what different variance levels for the pieces? What's the frequency of the drop? and the of this affix to be on items? Is it a prefix or a suffix? Will this be too good of a combination? on and on and on and then that you're just like wait a second i've just got items here i still have to do quest and then all and all the deep dive into all of that and it's 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 a uh, it's amazing to say i i have definitely gained appreciation and respect for um the people who design games because you guys have just so much to think about and so many pieces that you're running into um, yeah, that's why I'm, I'm kind of scared that I'm taking too much credit for all these things. Uh, it, takes a, <laughs> it takes a lot of people to work on these systems. But yeah, like you're saying, you uh, you start into things like items, and then you realize, oh, I got to step back and set up these, you know, building blocks for items. Right. What, how does the stat system even work? Right. You know, how right. how does the stats get updated as you play? And then you so okay, I kind of can't work on items for six weeks or something. <laughs> And this back stuff right and that never ends you know you're kind of yeah. always struggling with the the building blocks versus the cool stuff uh so yeah it's a it's a hard world <laughs> yeah I, I i admire your taking it on as you are <laughs> I've, been, I've been watching those streams too by the way and oh, thank you. it's cool to watch you making these decisions i think i even chimed in once or twice again but was disappearing <laughs> <laughs> i hope that i heard it and maybe somewhere in the back of my mind i took good knowledge there um <laughs> you know so uh, by the way everybody says you don't take enough credit uh, just so you, just so you know, um, I, okay, well, here, I think here's you're... an embarrassing story. <laughs> Go for it. I was telling some group of people that I invented the exclamation point above your head, right? Yeah. I was saying, uh, yeah, it was a lot of the systems you see in a lot of games were we created in Diablo 2. So I invented the a quest giver who had excla ex exclamation point over his head while you're walking by. And right next to me was Matt Householder, a guy in the team. And he said, actually, I invented that. And uh, 
It was true. He said he <laughs> mentioned a few things that I, I thought, oh my God, he did invent that. <laughs> I was just there, and I decided it was my invention. So I, I never walked out for it was you know it was kind of embarrassing. I mean, we laughed or whatever, but I felt bad that maybe I'm taking credit. <laughs> I, I, I know I did a lot of important things, but on the specifics, a lot of other people did a lot of cool stuff. Here. So every, I, I feel like that's just got to be true with everybody and everything, though. At some point, you're like, wait a second, <laughs> was I just there or did I actually create yep. it? You made this? <laughs> yes, I made this. <laughs> yep. That's fantastic. Um, okay, so Moonbeast creating an ARPG. What is the information beyond that that can be shared? Do we have a title that we can discuss? Do we have, uh, um, you know, anything specific to, you know, the design, to systems? Yeah, so I think that what I hope maybe Peter or Phil could. We do have a Reddit. Uh, link it. That we, post it in the chat. Have, mm -hmm. Yeah, so those guys could post a link. I think that we have a Discord also uh, that, that they could post. And we have a little sign up for information. Here, I'm, I guess I'm in pitch mode now. Uh, Get it. Pitch it right here. Uh, yeah, post yeah, all so those in the chat, please, you guys. That has, that has, those things have the official information we want to release. So I, I don't want to get too much into any other details that might be stuff we're holding back because I'm just in design world. I'm not in business world or whatever. Right. I'm just, I told these guys I'd join in if I could, you know, try to concentrate on design and not <laughs> company. So I don't want to speak too much, but I think what's, for me, what's really exciting is we are getting more into, we're doing a granular uh, procedural generation of levels mm -hmm. that uh, is ARPGs, you know, started that way. Diablo one was, you know, procedurally based on yep. a single tile. Yep. And Air, the history of ARPG gets into, well, let's make it cooler with set pieces. You could run into set pieces that were like, you know, a bunch of tiles we built ourselves, but then would get placed in the levels. And right. then even yeah. my own career, you know, into the torch lights and stuff, set pieces took over to the degree you see Diablo 4 now. I guess you could say they're <laughs> randomly generated dungeons, but uh, I, I, nah. I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go that far. I don't think they are. They, they don't get credit for that just because there's a one or two different branches. Right. Uh, so it's you know the whole. They've, all these big game, ARPGs have gone into the set piece direction, which is cool. I did it myself. It does lend to better screenshots. It does. It's it's good for boss fights when you want to involve the environment. But I think I really like getting back to the basics and making these maps completely random that really feel and play differently. And that's what I'm leaning into a lot here is the level plays differently when you start up a new level. It, uh, oh yeah, showing pictures there. That's yeah. the gloom. Yeah. That's some neat dynamics we're making. Uh, and you can also see there's a lot of hype going on. So what uh, what I'm trying to make happen, and I think it, it's working pretty well, is when you start a level, you explore, and it really makes your game. As you see in this thing, hey, if there's canyons down below, those play differently. There's different monsters down there. There's different the way you affect territories is completely different so i want you to to uh make hard overall strategic decisions on how to explore and interact with the level you're just showing right there uh we do a lot of terrain deformation so we we can destroy levels we can build them up uh and so what i what the level the level and the environment instead of being just flat play areas like a lot of RPGs is really just, you know, radically uh, different. So you, you could say there's like a little Minecraft element in there, but yeah. it's not sandbox and it's not, uh, you know, a creative world so much, but it's putting some of these elements into an ARPG level. So that's really, that's what I'm most excited about. That's what we're trying to make work. You know, some systems are hard to make skills work when the ground is getting destroyed beneath your feet. 
but at the same time, the, it's it's really fun and there's new experiences. I think replay replayability is really high. One of the one of the things I kind of look at is I play a lot of Civ Six, mm -hmm. and the way that the the worlds get generated really affects your game style. You know, yeah. you, you go in with one with one thought, and you realize, hey, I'm on an island, or I've got tough guys over here, and it changes how you you start playing the game. So. That's that's why uh, that's what I'm excited about with this new game. Wow! No llama RPG doesn't have destroyable terrain, chat. All right, Ugh, I can't do it. They're they're more advanced. Uh, that is, don't you boo me? That that is uh, amazing. I mean, honestly, just looking at these screenshots, first off, the game looks really beautiful. Um, I think there's just like gorgeous look to it but you can see even right here this screenshot speaks to me most like the idea here with the meteor destroying the terrain around you and stuff is awesome and i love the idea of being able to like build terrain up destroy terrain kind of build little forts maybe i mean there's all sorts of like potential uh to go along with that that is just awesome but I love this image because you can see the arc of this shot right here. And so I feel like this thing is just falling all the way down and sniping a monster and terrain like way down here. Yep. And, and yeah. is that how it will work? Absolutely how it works. Oh, uh, my gosh. And at times, I just like to find a perch like you're looking at there and just start destroying the cliffside uh, <laughs> around me. And what's neat is like there would be a lake or something up there or a, a lava lake or something. Yeah. And at some point you breach the lake and it starts leaking down into the canyons. And so wow. I spend half my time just just hanging out and shooting the, the environment at this point. Uh, but so uh, I don't know it, it, that the, the, that it's fun to just hang out and do that is really encouraging and promising that we're we're, we're doing something fun. Yeah, I think one more thing I gotta throw in here, and I'll get off of pitching my new project, is uh, this is great. We're building it. We're building it very moddable, so it's uh, we have really good mod tools. You can do them in game. In fact, that's what led to the destruction stuff that we do in game. Is uh -huh. we make all these mod tools, so while you're in game, you can build the levels. Uh, and they were like, "Hey, what? Uh, let's make the skills that build the levels." And that, that turned into this whole terrain destruction stuff. Uh, but we want this. We want people to go nuts with mods, make even different kind of games out of it. So yeah. we're we're starting that from scratch. That's awesome. And that's, I mean, I think a building four mods. Lamar well, RPG is doing it as well. Uh, building four mods is very important and all games should be doing it because there's just there's just so much that mods do and bring and enhance with games and it's it's like allowing that to be easier only i think builds more success potential for the game um plus then you get all the like yeah the like custom games and all of that that you know have been existing all over the place and existed in the past that were just amazing uh, so, I right. love it. I I love it. Yeah, I'll, I'm thinking right here, Dota with terrain mods, right? Destructible terrain Dota. It's gonna be built in your game. Yeah. In fact, we even got into that uh, design wise. We we're like, you know what? This this works really well as a team battler. Yeah. As you know, as you build walls and take down your opponent's walls, and we we even thought, hey, maybe we should. Put, push the game in that direction uh but that amongst about five or six other really cool ideas which like <laughs> you know what that's perfect fodder for modders kind of right. later on and maybe they turn something turn this engine into something really cool dodo was is one of our kind of models on that yeah and the other thing is that you know we're, we're we're going up against some of the biggest guys in the market right yep. poe 2 and diablo 4 and all these how do we stand out as a, as a small team with a no unknown ip so that's why we're doing we're trying to do some new things like this and they they have gone away from modding for a lot of reasons business yep. model yep. reasons and i think it's a, a direction that you know if we can make the game really fun to get enough people interested then they'll start going nuts with the mod tools 
I like to think that if you build a fun game, it will spread. That is that is my belief. If you build a fun game, if you build this great system with this moddable terrain and it's interesting and people can go in and create cool things with it, then it will spread on its own through word of mouth, through people playing it, enjoying it, getting others to play it. Um, yeah. So I think there is uh, plenty there. Plus, you guys have a lot of big names, I would say, at your company working on it that had success there. And people will uh, remember that and link you guys back to success and greatness and fun, um, you know, and hopefully dive into it. I mean, I, yeah. I, I'm looking forward to You already have me excited. I'm looking forward to it. Just seeing like... A few photos here and hearing some basic stuff like it already is cool yeah love to keep you updated and involved here as we go yeah um all right so yeah so that is all i'll post all those links as well below in my uh on the, the youtube description all that but that is over there in the chat um one final question piece on it beta testing alpha testing any demo pieces what's i'm guessing just get sign up on the site for the info but is there any current plans of that? yeah we are definitely targeting uh getting it into people's hands in some form next year uh you know maybe third quarter maybe fourth quarter but that's we want that to happen early both to kind of build up a modding community to get those guys started early. Maybe, you know, they can help us with ideas, but uh, <laughs> just, you know, to get feedback. And we, we, again, don't, we have a smaller company now, I think 14, 13, 14 guys, people. Uh, and then we, uh, we it, it's different from working at Blizzard where we yeah. had so much input from so many people. So we want to get it in people's hands so that they can let us know what to do. Yeah. And I think, especially nowadays, I think smaller companies are starting to again see more of the uh, uh, be seen more positively by the community. I, I think the the large AAA companies now have started to shift into such perfectly efficient monetized model machines that the games themselves are starting to lack in some ways. Um, and so the indie games and the games that are created by these smaller teams, people are starting to trend towards again and be like, oh, actually, this is where kind of the really big stuff is is coming out, the games that I'm really going to love. So, yeah, I hope so. And yeah, we can take chances that they can't really afford to. Exactly. Uh, but at the same time, it's hard to be seen these days. So many games coming out. Yes, there is. A good one. There is a lot. <laughs> Speaking of so many games coming out, what are your thoughts on some of the games making waves in the RPG space here in 2023? We've obviously got uh, Baldur's Gate 3, heavily D&D inspired. Have you had a chance to play that or see that at all? I have not, but not, but only because I just don't have time. I Same. bought the game and I installed it and I created the character <laughs> a couple times, but I haven't really got into it yet. I'm, I'm sure it will. I'm sure that'll take over uh, my time at some point soon here. But, and I, I watch streams of, of Baldur's Gate, so I, I know what it's all about and it, I love it. It looks awesome, but yeah. I haven't got into it yet myself. Probably How about good. yeah? How about Starfield? Same idea there, or same idea? That looks like it could easily occupy a lot of my time. <laughs> How about uh, Diablo Four? <laughs> I was I got I did play, which is weird because I almost don't play a other ARPGs at all because it's really hard for me to look at them. Uh -huh. I I look so critically. And again, it's kind of like I'm either jealous or I think they're stupid. <laughs> and it's, I, I can't have fun. But Diablo 4 was the first one I really got back into. And I did an intense, you know, maybe an intense 100, 200 hours. Wow. Uh, loving it. And then it just co I completely dropped it. Uh, yep. Because, I, you know what, I just, I think that the item game in the long run is terrible. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. 
I think that the game looks really good and it plays really good. The combat is 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 so perfect almost. It's just so comfortable and fun that you almost just do it for the combat. But I just couldn't. I just lost interest in the in the late game. I mean, I, I think. think that- I think you shared the same exact feelings as every other person. Started out, I, the campaign was a little easy for me, but beyond then it was like, okay, now we're starting to cook. Now we're starting to get there. And then you're just like, and I don't care about loot at all. And there's some missing features. And um, yeah, and then you just can't move on. So, yep. Yeah. Who knows? But they could bring it around. I mean, I didn't play much D three, but the you know the I hear that people say it came around a lot as it went, uh, and that Blizzard has the uh, great staff and the, all the money in the world. Yeah. They could bring it around the end game. I still have hope that I'll come back someday, but right now it's not doing it for me. Itemization still. There you go. There you go, Blizzard. Another another uh, vote for go back and adjust, fix that itemization. Uh, speaking further on other games, you have worked on some other games along your career as well. We had Hellgate London, we had Torchlight, obviously Rebel Galaxy, potentially some other ones in there as well. What were your favorite pieces uh, of these games and, and the designs uh, and systems you created along the way? Yeah, so I think... Uh... I lo- I loved I, I know I love game development so I'm, I loved working on all these things success or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hellgate was the biggest tragedy of my life. One, it's really <laughs> the only only disaster I've ever kind of worked on. You know, it's the only company that shut down and had to lay off everybody like in this yeah. horrible yeah. moment, worst moment in my life almost. But uh, we did so many cool things on that game that I just have a lot of fond memories. Of, of the systems that we created the, the the standouts for me are you know we kind of invented the looter shooter yeah uh, with this game we we did it in a, in a weird kind of dumb way we should have <laughs> looked at shooters and 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 extrapolated from that but we didn't we kind of took our weird diablo gameplay into over the shoulder can and trended it towards shooters but we never got the shooting part really right or perfect <laughs> Because we never even thought to, I don't, we didn't even think to try to copy the dynamics of other games. <laughs> so on our own, we kind of blew it. Uh, and it, it was always kind of a little too clunky. Uh, but we, I think we did really neat skill. My weird idea, again, maybe not successful, but we uh, I thought at the beginning, we need 100 different weapons, and they all do a completely different thing. Right. And we actually did that, and I think it was kind of cool. But there was negatives to that, uh, and you, you found a good weapon, and you never found a replacement that was a lot like it. Which right, was almost the biggest disadvantage. So I don't know. I loved creating the systems and the monsters and the three D procedural three D levels, uh, and so it was just a lot of fun. And I wish that I had made some better design decisions. Uh, I wish we had made some better business decisions. But the thing crashed down. Anyway, good time. Yeah. Uh, in the ashes of that, we created Runic Games mm-hmm. with uh, with Peter and Travis. Uh, they were they were a small team, a part of uh, Flagship Studios, which did the Hellgate. So we kind of grabbed that team in the in the explosion of Flagship, and created this team called Runic. We and made uh, Torchlight. Torchlight One was cool. It was we we su- we decided let's do this thing in a year or even eleven months. How do we do it in eleven months? Yeah. How do we make yeah. an ARPG? As you know, impossible. To make. I mean, good yeah. lord. Yeah, and so we stripped it way down, and we thought, how you know, let's how do we make this thing happen? And we did. We got that thing out in eleven months, wow. and it was pretty successful. Yeah. Considering uh, the small team in that. Uh, and then we got to do kind of the Diablo 2 thing again. We got, okay, that was a success. Let's make Torchlight 2. Yeah. And uh, what are all the things we wanted to do? Get into multiple. Torchlight 1 was single player, which helped a lot. And this right, 11 right, month right, right. Uh, So, yeah, got to just explore systems. 
I think uh, I think I did a lot of great loot stuff on Torchlight 2, too, so I love making loot and uh, love making unique items, love making all these different classifications of items, just pouring through those kind of systems. So I had a great time on that. I was uh, not involved like in the art of that one uh, much uh, or in... So I, Travis was a much bigger part of that game than I was. Okay. He was, he was really an, an incredible master behind of making games. And it was just like the team and me are just, how do we support Travis and getting these things done? <laughs> so that, uh, I think they were very successful again, team wise and financial wise, business wise. Uh, the, the way that thing ended though was for Travis, it was the worst experience of his life. He says, it was just too stressful, just too hard to manage all this stuff. I thought it was kind of a breeze compared to Diablo 2, but listening to him, I was like, oh my God, he's really not having a good time. He just, uh, this is killing him. Yeah. And so he's telling me why he's he's got to quit and why he's got to leave. I'm thinking, oh my God, we got to, uh, how, uh, he's talking. I, I stopped even listening to what he was saying. I'm thinking, <laughs> how do we make this company survive? We got to hire new people. We got to do all these things. This is a complete disaster. And after like 20 minutes or 30 minutes, he finally says, and so I was thinking just if, if you and I could just go and make a, a game on our own, uh, that would make it a lot funner. Do you want to do this? And I thought, oh, yeah, then I don't have to solve all these problems. <laughs> it would be a lot of fun. So, yeah, we just made a two-man game, Double Damage. It was the two, the, we were the double guys. Uh -huh. uh, and yeah. made, So a space game that we had at one point were kind of starting with at this runic company. That did pretty darn well too, and we wanted to change it up. We did Rebel Galaxy two. Uh, both what's what's they were fun games to make because they were mostly it was just Travis and I, and then just a couple more guys for Rebel Galaxy two. Yeah, it was just really fun to work on. Uh, you have so much impact and so much ability to change the games. The the kind of bummer they worked out for us well again financially, but the bummer is no the the market's kind of small, right for a space dogfighter game. Yeah. I, I kind of say in the, our problem is that our market was 50 year old men who had played freelancer <laughs> back, back in the nineties or something. Uh, so the market was small and just nobody has ever really heard of it. Uh, no one played it. Not, not no, just cause I think the market was kind of small, Yeah, which for me is weird because even my bad games like Hellgate, everybody has heard of or can talk about right yeah, and then i made double galaxy and they're like what what did you say what was the name again I, you know it's like so it did well for me money wise but no one's heard of it and it, so i like i'd almost rather make no money and then have something that people people like at yeah. this time so it was, it was in a way bittersweet or whatever but uh yeah so that's been my career till moon beast here so, so I'm not gonna lie, I as well had not. I I feel like I've heard of Rebel Galaxy in the smallest way, but my knowledge uh, of the game overall is pretty non-existent. But it sounds like a game that uh, I'll have to maybe potentially play through. Maybe we could do a a, a play along with the devs uh, of Rebel Galaxy sort of sort of piece sometime. Yeah, that'd be fun. Cause, that'd be cool. Yeah. Cause definitely, that, I'll definitely hook you up with a free key. <laughs> oh, heck yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it sounds, I mean, it sounds like something I would really enjoy, honestly. Um, all right, do you have time for a little bit more? I, again, I know we're like past. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit. Okay. I'm wearing down. I'm probably, okay. People are probably tired of my voice too. Oh no! Everybody wants to ask a million questions, but I I don't want to just blast you with it all. Um, what? Let's let's dive into game design overall a little bit. What do you think are your top three, two, three critical needs for a game to be successful? Are we talking? We're talking about ARPG ish, you know? R yeah, R yeah. R RPG, yeah. ARPG, exactly. So I think uh, there's 
there, there's a two, I th here, here are the big ones. I don't know. I'm making this up on the fly. Sure. Uh, one of them is a tactile feel. You know, you and this is what Diablo 4 gets right, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that we we did. I've done pretty good, but it's uh, your 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 attacks are responsive and. There's a lot that goes into this, but what I, 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 I just summarized with a visceral, tactile feel. It's the sound, it's the responsiveness of the attacks, it's uh, the, the visuals. All these things are really hard to do and really tricky uh, to get right and take a lot of work. Uh, but that's what it starts. If people yeah. think it's, it feels sloppy, they're never going to get past and look at your great itemization <laughs> if it's just kind of not you know not feeling right for him so you got to get that feel yeah uh pacing of rewards is super critical and that's one you know the pinata of at any point i might find something cool yep. but it's got to be layered on there with well i'm about to level up i'm about to finish a quest and it's going to have a reward uh and you know you just you got to layer those things with pacing in a way that people can't stop playing is yes. what you want to get the effect from this is okay i might be tired of the fighting but i just got to do this one last thing and then if i just you know try this thing out it might work and then so <laughs> that pacing thing is something you you really got to get going um and so oh and i think the final one is the, and this is a, where i differ from a lot of people on game design is I don't like good balance. It sounds it sounds radical. No, I'm with but, you. you know, the more balanced it is, the the blander it is. I really want spiky moments where you think I'm I'm overpowered. Oh my god, those dumb designers, they forgot that <laughs> I was just going to kill this thing. And so you get really excited and you're like taking advantage of the game, but then you realize, oh, you know what? It's kind of, I haven't found a new sword in a while. And it's kind of, I'm kind of struggling. I got to find, what it, I probably need a, a new sword or I got to switch my skills up. So I, I really want this feeling of, oh, okay, I'm overpowered or, oh, this class sucks. <laughs> I, I want you to bounce back and forth, you know, within boundaries or those things. Yeah. Uh, and that's what I, I think is a, a cool thing of ARPGs that, a lot of people don't like. I I I feel like Blizzard. I, I don't. I, I Diablo Four gets some of this right, but some of it wrong. Uh, but like they get the World of Warcraft. That's a different game, and PvP games are different. Yep. They have to be really tightly balanced. You have to be able to compare. Well, my level thirty guy should be just like some other level thirty guy in power. But that's exactly wrong for ARPGs. It should be ups and downs. Yeah, I. Uh... I, I completely agree with that. I love the imbalance. I love the imbalance of classes. Um, when people, one of the biggest complaints I, I hear on my channel is everybody wants melee to have splash, have big splash um, added to it. And I always think like, that. the more we bring everything to be the exact same, the blander it gets. You know, I, I think, keep it in wild differences uh, and, and how they play, where, where their strengths are, where their weaknesses are, and just balance. Uh, so I agree. And I also really love your answer on the pacing uh, of rewards. I think that's something that's um, an answer I wouldn't have, have thought uh, of, but it's something that I think, you know, the more you, you talk about it and I think about it, the more I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. Pacing rewards effectively, I think, does a lot for a game because there's many games I've played where either the rewards are too few and far between and so I just lose interest or they just constantly throw rewards at me nonstop and then I lose interest because it's just like flooded with it and I don't feel like it matters what I'm doing, you know. So I think that's um, a really interesting uh answer right there um what would you say over your career has been the biggest lesson that you've learned i think there's business lessons and game design lessons one of each then uh, let's go and there's, <laughs> so uh i think business lessons are 
uh, is that you you got to find business partners, whether they be investors or uh, or publishers or whatever, that uh, have aligned expecta expe expectations and aligned interests. Uh, so, like where I've gotten trouble business wise is having too many partners that all have different wants. Hellgate London, a quick example of. Uh, we had uh, Asian business partners to handle the Asia market. We had yeah. U.S. business partners to handle the U.S. market. They wanted different games, and <laughs> it was impossible to please them both. Yeah. And then when things were getting a little rough, like, hey, we need some more money and some more time, neither partner cared enough because uh, they said, well, yeah, we could if you turn it into an item sales game for Asia, or we could if we just concentrate on you know, a, a box sale for U.S., but neither, but so we couldn't make these arrangements work out because people weren't aligned. Yeah. Uh, management wise, this one's this one's tough because it's really hard personnel wise. But I think you you gotta identify and uh, try to move on people on the team who are kind of poison. Now, uh, poison doesn't mean bad, and people are is it, it, but you know if you identify, hey, we, it's happened. You know, we have a great employee. But just kind of bringing down the rest of the team, probably best to get rid of that guy early. It's very hard to do because I have friends with almost all these people. Yeah. Uh, but that's kind of a lesson that is, is brutal. Uh, and then design-wise, I think it's, be, it's the iteration. It's just, you know, be willing to screw the game up for a little while to try things out uh, and see what's good and see what's not. Build into what's good. And just remove what's bad is is kind of the what I find the the way to go, you know, development wise. So if those help. <laughs> those are great. Those are all great lessons there. Um, all right, final bits. A couple Diablo questions here for you. Number one, the Easter egg with the souls. Do you have knowledge and remembrance of this? Brevik said he remembered it, but didn't remember who designed it or put it in. Um, if you need a refresher on what I'm talking about. Yes, I do. <laughs> so if you get four souls together and just stand around them for a while, uh, I can I can even show you really fast in the video here the souls will stop attacking you and then they will create letters in the game that is this, a, this isn't ringing a bell at all so far so okay that is they've got a d and then there's an e we're guessing david eric then there's an m Oh, sorry. I'm not. I'm not showing it to you guys. Let me. Sorry. Here we go. We have the souls, and they stop attacking, and they will start forming letters. And this is some weird, wild Easter egg that apparently somebody did find way back in an earlier version of the game uh, that it was working. So here's E for Eric. We're guessing. And uh, yeah, we're we're trying to figure out who put this in. Additionally, you get a you get a big magic find boost. Here's M for Max. Potentially, again, we're all just guessing. The fourth letter might be a clue here. <laughs> uh, we think there's a, a, a this one is confusing. Maybe like a a devil's face with horns or something maybe a v this one uh, is the only one that's not really a great letter but then i think we have a, a p or an r i was thinking r could be if uh could be rick cease yeah who's one of the and engineers then, and here possible that he made this happen but no i've never seen this before and it's pretty cool all right, P for Phil probably. All right, well we're still we're still on the hunt for who built this in. Right, <laughs> still on the hunt. And then an S maybe for Shank, maybe for Steve, maybe for uh, 
Who knows? Still on the hunt. It's, Please, it, I don't, I don't, uh, yeah, I, if somebody figures it out, I'd like to know. <laughs> um, chat Jam. Any any information on that one? Nope. <laughs> chat Jam. <laughs> the, Is that yeah, two words? The, the Chat Jam in, in the lobby. Oh, sorry. Chat, yeah, chat, not Cat. Sure. Not Cat, sorry. Chat. Yeah. So Chat Jam. What, uh, chat Jam. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm getting delirious. This is, we're going overtime for me here. Um, <laughs> jam. Yeah, the, the gem. I remember the gem. Whoever was building the AI, I think it was Ben Booz, just had the gem in there as a design element. You know, it was just something to look cool. And then sitting around, and this is how a lot of stuff happened, right? We're uh -huh. just sitting at a table, me, Dave, a couple, of, a couple guys, just, you know, looking at the thing. And somebody got it in their head hey let's let's can you click that gem or what if we just made it as a button and uh <laughs> oh so, so, yeah let's make it into a button and they're saying well does it do anything and so, so we got into an explanation uh, got into a discussion yeah we here's the kind of things we could do maybe it does something and uh i'm not going to say whether it does something or not oh my gosh <laughs> so, so i'm gonna leave you hanging the here. troll continues but, the troll continues. It does do something. Whether it's something important or interesting, I'm not going to say. <laughs> it does something outside of, say, gem activated. Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. But probably not in the way that most people think what might be happening. I mean, the, you know, the old rumors, I don't know where things stand. I'm not, uh, but the There's old rumors one, you know, a perfect activation would help magic fine. Right. These kind of things. Right. Uh, there, I will kind of say that there is, there's no like stat boost. <laughs> uh, kind of. <laughs> I, will, I will kind of say that. Y'all are but no, you're not, not going to get the you're not going to get the story out of me. Y'all are killing us! Oh my <laughs> god! All right, chat gem still a mystery, everybody. Well, Eric, you have given us more than uh, enough time here. We are forever, forever grateful for now. I can't even speak. It's I'm you know. Yeah, we are forever grateful for this interview. Thank you so much. Uh, do you have anything parting you wish to, to say, you wish to add? Uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. This was a whole lot of fun. Uh, maybe we find a reason to do it again. That would be cool. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, again, pitch on Moon Beast. It's early yet. We don't have much, but there's a sign up on our page. Soon it'll be a sign up for that like alpha access that you were talking about oh, heck yeah. Uh, heck yeah so yeah that's uh, that's it thanks for everybody i haven't really been reading the chat but maybe i'll look through and see see cool stuff or horrible <laughs> criticism. no everybody everybody loved it they all just wanted more questions but you know <laughs> at some point uh, uh you know we gotta let you catch your breath and relax so we uh, again thank you so much and hopefully we can get a, a panel together or something here maybe in the future and, and oh yeah that would be fun too have you Sounds guys good. yeah just shoot it all right thanks eric have a good one all right thank you bye bye bye, bye everybody